Hello, everybody. And I wanted to go ahead and take a couple of minutes here and run through some things for week three. We've had some uh, had some interesting um, some comments this week on a couple of different things. Um, and I wanted to take a, a minute here before I get into the lecture to uh, go ahead and review a couple of things. Um, I did actually update in there. This is your example for the article. Um, if you want to use that, or you can use the, uh, you can use just a, an essay format. Either one is fine, but this is the example I was referring to. Um, also, this case study introduction, this kind of gives you the outline of a case study that you can go, kind of go through um, everything that you're looking at. Um, here we have um, the chapter seven and then the discussion at Starbucks. So um, as we take a look at that, um, this is also the, the, the PowerPoint that will actually be going down and, and around, um, that we'll take a look at, um, in just a second here. And then, um, what I can do is then, uh, we'll go over that part of it. But if you have any questions on the rest of this, just let me know. Um, but these were the two additional items that we were looking at. So let's take a look here, make sure that I'm on the right screen. Uh, so let me go ahead and change this, change this share and new share. There we go. All right. So let's take a look at, uh, take a look at managing teams here. So as we take a look at this, this aspect of, of teams, teams are a really important part of what we do today. Okay. Um, and in the in the in the business environment, so uh, and I understand some of you have some trepidation and some hesitation about groups. To be honest with you, you shouldn't, but because we actually have to work in business, we have to work with others, and um, you know whether that's a big team or a small team, you're still going to have to really make um, the inroads to being able to handle this in the business environment today. So take a look at this. Um, when we take a look at this, we talk about a group. It's just basically a group is two or more people that kind of interact. So um, basically that you might have some, uh, each person might influence each other. Okay. But realistically, a group is just a people that you can get together and really make, make decisions. A team is more of an interdependent group. Okay, so you take the group and you're going to mold them into a team. Um, so they have a common goal, they share accountability, um, and all of that type of, of uh, items. So categorization of groups. Um, first of all, we have formal groups and informal groups. Uh, formal groups are those that are set out by the organization. Um, informal groups are ones that we create amongst ourselves um, to get a job or task done. Work groups um, basically are ones that are formed by the organization to get work done. So a work group is going to be kind of the group together that's um, you might be put together as a as a project, as a project work group um, to work on a particular proposal um, or something along those lines. Kind of like the matrix structure a little bit where you bring a group of people together to work on something because they all have that commonality and something to bring to the table. Um, there is a command group, um, is a work group, one that a uh, formal group of the, has, has a relatively permanent group, um, has functional reporting relationships, and is usually up and included in the, in the organizational chart. Um, affinity groups are a collection of employees from the same level the organization meet on a regular basis, such as a, you know, you might have the vice presidents that meet of an organization that meet on a regular basis, or you might have the vice president of communication who's, who meets with the same group of directors every week um, to hold a staff, uh, kind of like a staff meeting um, that share information and capture things that might be happening and, or to solve some problems. So in this screen here, what we've got is this aspect of the different kinds of teams. Functional teams 
um, are all are ones that all come from the same department or functional area. Cross-functional teams come from different departments, kind of like the matrix structure we talked about from an organizational perspective. Um, problem solving teams. This is one of those where you've got um, you've got a problem, so you put a team together to kind of solve that problem um, and make some improvements. Um, Self-directed teams, they set their own goals and pursue um, and basically operate entirely on their own. Um, venture teams, um, they're de usually developed for uh, new products or new lines or those types of things. Um, and they kind of create our self-autonomous, but they uh, um, but they really do act within a constrained environment. Virtual teams um, are basically just exactly that. They're um, from different areas, maybe of the country. Um, and then your uh, your coworkers are working remotely. This virtual teams and um, global teams are both of those that have become much more prevalent in the last few years. Face to face, uh, global teams are face to face or virtual teams. They're all from different countries. Um, certainly, in several businesses, that's the norm now. Uh, especially businesses like IT, um, telecommunications, and other types of things are also. Um, most of those are in the global environment these days. Um, this is kind of a, these are informal groups. You have an interest group um, that might be formed around an, an activity or something that you like to do. Um, or a friendship group is a uh, permanent, and, you know, your group of friends that go out and you might go to dinner, you might go to a show, um, but there's actually some social benefit to its being a member of it. Group composition, um, very, very key here. Um, the degree, basically you're looking to put it to, when you put a team together, you're really looking, when you're looking at a, you want to make sure that you're able to work together. Okay. So homogeneity is the degree which members are similar in one or more characteristics. Okay. So, um, in heterogeneity, um, is the degree in which they differ. Okay. So you want to, um, you know, you want, um, uh, to be more heterogeneous if you're got a really complex problem or task, or you're developing something that's great, being creativity, you want lots of variety, lots of diversity. Um, if it's a simple problem, you can get away with ones that are, you know, have um, all the same type of characteristics. Size of the group really depends on the task. Okay. Um, really, you know, it's the larger the group, the more difficult to manage. The larger the group, um, the more creativity you have, though. So, and you get this aspect of social loafing. I always love this term. Uh, social loafing, which is this aspect of some of the, and we've all been in groups like that, where the group is fairly big and you can get a couple of outside outliers that kind of hang around, but not really putting a lot of effort um, into the team. So um, you want to make sure that the group size, if they're not doing any work and they don't have any work to do, then you, you might need to downsize that group. Um, the things that, do, these are factors that determine, uh, group size, um, interaction and influence, uh, the ability to interact with each other, the maturity of the group, group tasks, and the ability of the group leader to deal with and communicate potential conflicts and task activities. So this is all about how the size, the makeup of the group that can dictate the size. Sometimes smaller is better. Other times larger is better. You take a look at this, the group norm is the standard of which the appropriateness of the behavior is judged. Um, and that's really, you know, the group will take on the personality of its members. Um, and they'll be governed a lot by the um, the situation. Um, enforced for actions that are important to the group member uh, and purpose of the norms, basically just to help the group run, okay? So you really want to have some group norms when you're dealing with a group. Group cohesiveness, okay, you know, 
this is how the group works together. Okay. And how the different, um, you know, it's, it's the, you know, like you, the better the group stays together, the more attractive the group is. There's a lot of resistance to people leaving because people, and there's motivation to remain a member of that. Informal leadership, this aspect that basically um, draws on referring or expert power that you can pull into the group um, that kind of you makes you become rise to the top, so to speak. Okay, so there's something that you can do that will benefit that. Okay, um, so this informal leadership is just something that's organic. It just happens within groups where that one person kind of rises to the top for one reason or another. Um, these are some of the factors that increase co cohesiveness um, and what those consequences are. Okay, um, so you know, these are all the factors. These are what ends up happening. Um, this is what happens when you decrease the cohesiveness and where what happens for those. So these are just some of these aspects to take a look at just to be able to familiarize yourself kind of with what happens when you when you ask when you put a group together. You notice a lot of these are the opposite of what we talked about earlier. Implementation of the team's uh, team phasing. Okay, so this is as you as you come in, this is what happens. The team makes a decision that plans the implementation and it's startup, and then it goes reality. Leader set, then you have a leader centered team, then you have a tightly formed team, and then you have a self managing team. So these are the types of this processes that a group will go through as it is actually implementing the actual teams aspect of this. So you, you kind of go through this five stage process when you decide to implement a team because they, um, and as it goes through to become a self-managing team. So you don't start out a self-managing team, you grow into being a self-managing team. Okay, and this is kind of, these this shows you the evolution of a group. OK, you've got a new group formation or you add new ta new members. OK, so you get into this first group, you got mutual acceptance. OK, you start out making acquaintances, you know, sharing information, discuss discussing the subject um, that are unrelated to the task, you know, testing one another, um, being defensive. You're, you're going to have this aspect of getting in there to get this mutual acceptance. Then you get into the communication phase, okay, in decision making. Then you start expressing attitudes, norms, goals, um, and discussing tasks. Then you get into the productivity phase and you get cooperation, uh, actively, you, know, you work on actively on tasks, you're being creative. And then the control in the organization, you're working on um, independently assign, uh, assigning team, bat, team tasks. Um, you're being spontaneous, you're being flexible, you're being self-correcting, all of these aspects are the, as you go through this process. And then when you're, once you're done there and you're doing some assessment, then you're going to maybe add some new team members if it's, you know, or, and then start the process all over again. Now, this doesn't, this is tough. This is a process that's not easy. OK, everybody wants it to be a quick fix these days and group work is not necessarily a quick fix. You've got to really work on being a cohesive group. You, you've got to understand the costs and benefits of managing a team. The benefits are, as you can see here, reducing costs, um, employee benefits, you know, they feel invested. OK, they they increase their performance. Um, and then other organizational reference benefits for just things like good morale and those types of things that come out of man out of teams. The costs are difficulty uh, di they're difficult to change. They they slow down the process a little bit, and then they um and then they drop they drop the team man the team model too quickly without giving everybody a chance to to um, really catch up on that. These are some of the benefits to teams in the organization. Uh, 
and how what those specific events are and some examples of that on and these are all right there for you performance and implementation of teams okay this is what happens where you start you have startup you get this ask this curve of un reality unrest and then you get to the point of leadership control teams then you get over up in here where you get the curve where you know you've got tightly formed teams and then you have self-managed teams so it starts it starts a, a group starts out then it drip dips down into what's acceptable and then you get this aspect of once you get to a leader center team then you're you're basically at the you're at your, your baseline and then from there you just kind of go up and then that's where you get into the more the really productive teams so as you can see, uh, teamwork competencies are all about basically no different than your individual competencies. The only difference is you're sharing them over the group. But they're kind of um, kind of can, can create some ethical issues. You know, did you distribute the work? Um, did the team own the blame, or did it um, assign the blame to somebody else? The same with the credit, or the opposite of that. Um, how do teams ensure participation, resolve conflict, make decisions? And how do they avoid deception and corruption? Okay, so all of these are four ethical issues for teams that we as managers need to be aware of. And then we get virtual teams. Okay. So there's, yeah. When you take a look at challenges, you know, geographical um, separation, feeling isolation, difficult to perform the standard, um, many functions need to be performed by the team and there might not be a leader present, okay? Now, these are some of the advantages over here, you know, matching, building community, establishing clear motivating person uh, and shared vision. Uh, leading by example and focusing on measurable results, coordinating and collaborating across organizational boundaries. So these are the pluses. <sighs> diversity and multicultural diverse teams are creative and innovative. They're, they're fantastic. Um, what can I say? You know, multicultural teams really bring a lot to the table. Yes, there is some possibility for some misunderstandings and some other those types of things. And communication might be an issue, but usually you come up to some really unique solutions to your problems when you actually manage in the diverse environment. Um, I used to manage um, very diverse teams with many cultures, um, and the creativity that came out of those groups was was really, really phenomenal. You know, talk about, uh, you know, in non-Western cultures, um, the uh, in non-Western cultures, meaning is embedded in the way the message is presented. In Western cultures, they have a difficulty interpreting indirect communication. Um, so as opposed to Eastern ones, obviously have the opposite of that. There's a... Uh, Differing attitudes towards um, hierarchy and authority. Um, and there also could be confliction in norms, okay? Um, sometimes in gender, sometimes in, in, sometimes it's just against other people of other cultures. It's, it's going to be really, it's always really interesting when you have a multicultural team, how to manage that, because things come up like you wouldn't uh, come up that are not. They're out of the ordinary, and you've got to really move to solve those quickly, those issues. All right, if you have any other questions for this week, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll be back next week. Thank you.